and he runs and and uh, is the owner of Trails in Farm, and he is going. He has utilized the program um, as well as implemented a number of practices, and so he's going to talk uh, and do an interview style with Dr. Chris Hostetler um, about. Um, about his experience and, and the benefits that he sees from a producer's perspective, because that's uh, obviously, I highlighted two things, right, for the industry and for the producer, and so we have to make sure we keep that, um, keep that top of mind. And I'll just a reminder, I didn't see any hands go up through that whole time, but um, if you have a question for me or anybody, just kind of raise your hand. We'll just do this uh, pretty interactive. It is a workshop, after all. Uh, so with that, Dale, do you want to come up here? And Dr. Hostetler, I will hand you have yours. Okay. We started it. Okay. Well, well, good afternoon, folks. I'm Chris Hostetler. I'm the director of animal science for the National Pork Board. I've been there about 11 years, and um, and really interested in the sustainability from the idea of how nutrients flow through the system, right? From the whole. Uh, from a holistic standpoint, um, thinking about how um, we feed pigs a packet of nutrients. We call it corn or soybean meal, right? And that those nutrients pass uh, through the animal. They're included in the pork then that leaves the farm in terms of a retail product, but they also pass through in terms of manure, enter the soil, go into uh, use for fertilizer to then go into crops that can be fed back into the pig, right? So that's the that's the cycle of nutrients that I'm sort of interested in as a swine nutritionist. So um, that's a little bit about me. Dale, why don't you just tell them a little bit about your uh, the swine portion of your farming operation? I'll, I'll do that, Chris, and thanks for the introduction. Do I have to talk, talk into it? I should be on. Technical difficulties. I, I don't have these problems at home. Wink, wink. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Try this. There we go. Um, yeah, as producer from east of Minnesota, um, Fortunate to be on a century farm, a farm that my, my grandfather started, and um, he started because he had some Chester White pigs and was able to move a mile east from where the, the Steve Mer homestead is. Um, my, my dad took the operation over in 1959. Um, I went to Iowa State, graduated from there, spent a couple years as a, I say, tongue-in-cheek my missionary years at um, as a loan officer for farm credit mm -hmm. gotta remember this is also right the right the tail end of the farm crisis in the late 80s so there, w there was a lot of stress going on at that time um, and then in 88 was given an opportunity to to try my hand at, at farming I moved into at that point a, a typical farrow to finish operation a single site farrow, farrow to finish that was pretty common at that time. Um, moved and morphed it through the years and then about six years ago uh, sold the sows just because of a number of health reasons, whether it was herd health, my mental health, financial health, mm -hmm. um, things like that. I just, I said I'm, I'm done with that. So at that point I remodeled most of the buildings and now have uh, 2,000 head of finishers on site and custom finishing for a for a family out of Nicollet. Yeah, so you contract grow now for a family out of Nicollet? Yes, I do. Um, and tell us a little bit about the grain side. I know you're also a crop farmer, so tell us about your grain operation too. So we have, um, we, we own 450 acres of crops. I, about 20 years ago, started doing some equipment ownership with a, with a neighbor. And so we do a lot of the crop work together. Um, coincidentally, it was six years ago, I started no-tilling and that was, Kind of planned, but not really, I was, mm -hmm. and didn't know to what degree I was going to do it. And I was just like, well, we're going to do everything. Um, had been using some cover crops and have moved up to 100% cover crop usage also. Um, and 
and it have moved to or to the practice we call planting green. So the cover crops are um, are still growing. We plant and then, especially on corn, a few days later we will terminate the cover crop with Roundup, uh, and then also use another um, more of a um, more of a pre-emerge herbicide that that lasts and has a little more you know, does a better job of killing broadleaves and things like that. Um, the soybeans, I have let them grow longer, I think almost too long, the, especially the cereal rye. So it's, it's constant, constant tweaking. The, the one thing I like about raising pigs, I can make a lot of mistakes in a year's time and learn many times during the year. Crops, I can make a mistake and learn one once. So I get about 40 mistakes I can make in crops. <laughs> yeah. but, but pigs, it was, Especially when I was farrowing weekly, I could make uh, that many in a, in a year's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so uh, the crops that you grow on your farm, um, your corn and soybean meal is sold to the open market, or do you use that then to feed back into your, uh, into your swine operation? That's, that, that's a great question, Chris. And um, when, I, when I did have my own farrow to finish operation, had an on-farm feed mill, all of my corn was being fed back to the pigs and hit that perfect nutrient cycle that you talked about with, um, you know, stuff grown on my farm would get, the, you know, the manure would, well, the feed would get upcycled into protein and what was remaining would, would get put out in the fields and, and grow the next crop. Um, now that I am custom finishing, the feed is coming from a different mill. I'm able to sell it to a, a pig farmer a mile down the road so the, the corn for me is still kept pretty local. Um, change the soybeans to growing soybeans for seed. So most of them will are contracted and, and go for that purpose. Mm -hmm. There are occasional years where it goes to, um, will go into a, a um, more into the open market. And being in South Central Minnesota, we have one plant in Fairmont and two soybean meal plants in Mankato they're both 30, 35 miles from me. So there's a, if I'm doing that, there's a good chance some of that, that meal is coming back onto my farm. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so let's change the topic just a little bit and, and tell us more about your um, experience around the um, Your Farm Sustainability Reports. Um, how did you first learn about, the, uh, about that as an option and how did you learn about those on-farm uh, sustainability reports? I happened to be on a National Pork Board Task Force for Soil Health mm. and, and actually Soil Health and Water Quality. I believe that was the term yeah. that was used on it. And as we discussed some of the vendors and some of the goals that we had for doing a report like this, when the pilot project was offered to Minnesota, I was contacted by a staffer in, at Minnesota Pork Producers. And, and asked if I would be one of the, I'm gonna say nine or 10 producers in Minnesota that, that put their farm data into it. So mm -hmm. I was a little bit of an early adopter being able to put my net 2020 data in at, at that point in time. And then, you know, the results were, were given to me and then uh, it was easy to do it for the 21 crop year. Yeah, so um, tell us a little bit about, so you, you've, you're two years into it now so tell us a little bit about your um, experience working with SEC, the Sustainable um, Environmental Consultants, who actually help and assist, as I understand, in getting your data uh, um, put into the system to generate the report. So tell us a little bit about that experience. So working with SEC has been really good. It, for, for me, it's been a couple of um, phone call interviews um, and really providing data that I have already in some of our precision um, data databases that, that we run. So I personally run Ag Leader Equipment for the monitor work. Um, John Deere, Case IH, Raven are mm -hmm. all capable of, of moving information up to the cloud and then SEC can be given permission to just pull that in. So that, that part is real seamless and mm -hmm. easy and, and especially as I use my monitor for doing more things, you know, planting, side dress application, manure application, harvest, that, that's the bulk of the data that is needed. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes real easy at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it ends up being a, a good relationship and, and actually when it was, 
when it was first proposed to me and I talked to Austin Knight, our, our technician, he, he was basically saying, you know, whatever data you have, Dale, just get it to us and, and we'll figure it out. So even if it was a bunch of pieces of paper I threw in a shoebox and handed to him, he could sort it all out. Mm -hmm. um, I'd try to keep things a little more organized. And, and like I said, now every, every step, every year, I seem to be having more of it in my magic, magic box that rides with me everywhere. Yeah, so was there any pieces of data that you didn't expect to um, have to include that you actually ended up having to go track down or find, or um, was there any challenge with um, organizing your data and uh, getting it to SEC? So the one I haven't done yet is water use. Uh, yeah. Um, and that, is, that will, by the end of the year, I'll, I will have some data, and then next year will be a lot better. And that's because I'm installing water meters on as I go. Um, so that's water use on your farm, on your um, swine operation, or is that irrigated water? I don't even know. Oh, you, oh, you maybe oh, not don't uh, irrigate. I don't no, know. No, in God's country, we don't have to irrigate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I set you up for that one. <laughs> yeah. um, no, these these are in barn water meters, um, yep. and and so I I just started putting a couple in in July, and then I didn't had a real quick turn on the last group of pigs so didn't have a chance to put it in the in the third barn I was going to put it in yeah and how often do you think you'll monitor that water meter information um, um, I tend to be looking at it once a week or so okay. and I, and I believe the way this is set up I can also set it up with a limit if there's a something that gets you know an excessive mm -hmm. usage such as water line break I can get a I can get a notification yeah Otherwise, I tend to notice it at night or in the morning when I go through and do chores that I've got a water line break. Sure, yeah. So I would prefer to know a little quicker. Yep. Um, and then the other, probably the one other thing was electric use. Oh, yeah. Um, and the, I think the, fir the first year I did that was a little bit of more of a struggle, or I think I punted on that. I said, mm -hmm. no, I don't have it. And then for last year, for another reason, which kind of goes along with the continuous improvement, yeah. I would... Um, I started watching my electric use and um, made a decision to put in solar panels that mm -hmm. should get should become operational by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Well, that was going to be one of my other questions: is what are what are some of the management decisions that you or or changes in your management that you have decided uh, to make based on the outcome of your sustainability reports and how might those management decisions change the output for the report yeah and that is, that is the one change I've made yeah so mm -hmm. the other things like I said I was doing I'm doing no-till and cover crop and I'm just kind of kind of I'm in kind of a holding pattern to monitor that and then make decisions on anything else I, I want to do um, I you know some some of the, the things that you that you showed on there the you know, buffer strips, well, that's mandatory in Minnesota, so I have, I have some acres of them. Um, I do have some pollinator habitat. I got some native wood ground so I'm, and a couple grass waterways, so I'm hitting all that, too, just because mm -hmm. just, just of the way that the lay of the land and, and how we had to do things to take care of the ground. And do you have those already in your current report, or do you need to add those in on the third iteration? I, think, I don't think I had the grass waterways okay. in. I didn't yeah. know that was... That was something we were looking for. Yeah, so yeah, good. I, I, I can add something, but it, but it is that's a practice that I start, that I did about five, six years ago yeah. on, on that field. Yeah. Question back here. Let me hand you the mic. How much information do you have to pay? Do you have to provide around the composition of the feed, like specifically into your feed formulas and the amounts of the ingredients? Actually, at this point, I've never been asked about what's in the feed, and and I would be able to once again say, well. In house, I would ha be able to find the answer because because my wife does work for the company that is providing the feed for the pigs. But otherwise, um, you know, you, you don't have to have a spiff. You know, you don't have to throw everything out there. The other thing I want to mention that has not been mentioned yet: this data that I provide in that report is confidential information for me. Um, and. I've had a couple ways to verify it. Probably the easiest, the, the best way to verify it. My daughter was an intern at National Pork Board, and she could look and see. I think she could see who put stuff in, 
but she couldn't see any information beyond that. Oh, and you're saying, well, that's the summer intern. Also, a week and a half ago, we talked to the chief operating officer at Pork Board. He has no more access than what Beth did for, for the information. So my information that's in there is, is confidential to me. I can share the reports with who I want to, um, but any of the data that, that you will see on these reports becomes aggregated and clumped in so that you, you couldn't sort a certain farm out regionally, statewide, nationwide. And you know, this, this really has some, some strong potentials for showing things. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know there was a report that came out a couple weeks ago where using some of this information, we're seeing that in, was it 21 that for Iowa Select that, that, re yeah. that reduced nitrogen cost, re reduced fertilizer costs on the field by $158 where they use swine manure versus, uh, versus the, the fields that use commercial fertilizer. Yeah, big difference. That, I mean, that's, that, it, and it's not mentioned in there, the, the thing that I see is the corn yields better. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the soil health part, right? Yes, is yes it is. Tilth is better and um, better microbial populations and, um, and microorganisms that live there, so certainly. Um, you just mentioned briefly, um, you can share this, these reports with really anybody that you would like to. How, what are your intentions with the reports in terms of, of um, um, sharing them with your lenders or with uh, uh, the, the guy that you talk to at church? Or um, how, how do you intend to use these reports to tell your sustainability story? Um, it, it is private information, so I'm, I'm going to be careful. Um, but something on potential landlords, I have shown it to mm -hmm. my lender just so that they're aware that these things are out there. Um, maybe not to, I haven't gotten to the point where I figure out how to monetize any of this yet. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm yeah. still working on that a little bit and hopefully Dr. Dr. Ingram will have some better answers for me on that, but yeah. I, I've, I'm not too, you know, I'm holding my breath on that, but not hard. Um, you know, I, if I, I can see if there's a permitting issue, if there is some feedlot, um, if you're looking at a feedlot ordinance on a county level, yeah. whether it's mine personally or just some aggregate that can get pulled out and, and you start looking at, you know, here's the real impact of it, not, not necessarily what you, what's out there as far as, because there are opponents, believe it or not, to people raising pigs. And they, and they paint in a little bit different story than what I see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned that just made me think, um, you mentioned, oh, I've got grass waterways planted in, but I haven't included them in my reports. Really, uh, if you look at our We Care um, sustainability uh, goals and metrics, a lot of it is around getting you, getting producers credit for the things that they're already doing, um, not having to uh, really expand it, what it is that they're doing, um, at a costly, uh, you know, in a costly effort, but really just giving them credit where credit is due. You also mentioned, you know, you, in your history of your farm, you talked about um, how you would have used the manure to then f grow the grain and feed it back to your pigs, and that's really regenerative agriculture, right? Yep. Before that was such a, like, popular thing to say. Our farmers have been doing it for a long time, so how do we get them credit for, for um, working in that space? So It's it's taking this data, the proof that Ashley mentioned earlier. You know, we're able to we're able to prove things, especially where when you look at a number of farms, it's not one tillage, it's it's not Dale out there doing no-till cover crop that makes it look so good. Because I'm a, I'm a real small slice of that, but you start looking at the tillage, and it's and it's all over the board, and yet our we're capturing carbon and r reducing erosion. And now that, now that we're starting to get enough data in and across enough farms that we can actually see that this, really, this is really happening, this is real world, um, now we can go out and start, we can, we can start talking the talk and, and, and moving, moving things forward so that, so that our, the opportunities for us as producers continue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th thank you for um, agreeing to come and share your experience a little bit with the group. Is there anything that, um, that I didn't ask about that I forgot to ask about that you would think of? And this is supposed to be my elevator speech time, isn't it? Oh, sure. <laughs> you can do that. Um, 
really, really the, the most important part about this is when, when you look at these, your farm reports and how it's all rolled together, this is real data coming from real farms provided by real farmers. And this will all make a real difference too. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna help overall in, in Im improving um, the, the trust level between, between pig farmers and consumers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great job and um, thank you very much. Again, really appreciate your time today. I know um, busy and it's a Sunday and um, all of those things. So I'm, I'm always grateful for our producers who are willing to um, step up to the plate, um, go above and beyond and for the good of our whole industry. So thank you so much, Dale. Questions from the audience. Anybody else have question that we can answer? Hold on one second. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at your two big issues that come up around sustainability and farming practices? One of them is our nitrogen leaching, okay? And so have you looked at your uh, water, uh, um, uh, water levels, nitrogen water levels uh, in off, coming off your farm? No, I have not done that. I, you know, as, as you're talking about that, I can think of one or two places where it would be just my water on a tile outlet that I probably could look at, but yeah. I have not. You know, that goes back to some of the issues that was brought up with the Clean Water Act a few years ago was uh, not only the runoffs, but the uh, water um, table underneath that soil. Right. And looking at that, some people have put in um, test wells essentially to be able to check that. So that, I assume that to be part of the end goal uh, with looking at this is to be able to evaluate that. The other one is uh, soil organ organic matter within your, your soil. Uh, have you started monitoring that to see if you are incrementally increasing that or not? I have been doing enough soil tests on a grid basis that I, if I look back, I could see if there has been a, a change. Um, I, I don't think that is I, I'll have to get some good advice from agronomists if soil organic matter is a, is a real solid number that, that is definite because I know you can have changes like in your phosphorus level mm -hmm. or nitrates depending on what time of season, but if organic matter is more of a constant, then yeah, I can go back six, eight years and see, see what I've got. And um, I do have a pretty wide range. I mean, I've got some ground that is a peat ground and it, the last time the last stuff was 34% organic matter. So right. that one, I'm not sure I can improve a whole, increase a whole lot. But right, <laughs> not sure you want to, you know, but, <laughs> but uh, no, that is, uh, when, so when we're looking at soil health itself, soil organic matter is obviously one of those incremental things that we have done a great job over the years of depleting, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, therefore anything that we can do to incrementally increase that at a cost effective program okay would be extremely beneficial the other one is the soil biology in itself i don't know if if that's also an, a, a point that you um uh, are, are starting to look at evaluating on a on an annual basis um, that i won't i don't i haven't done real testing on i guess i have a couple of times got a got a you know done a couple of tests to see what it could be um but but I can I physically can see the difference in the soil. I can see the difference in the in the in the plants. Um, it's been four or five years since I've used a fungicide and insecticide, other than for corn rootworm, and uh, the the crops are healthy as can be. They mm -hmm. just they look great. Um, going back a little bit to your nitrogen question, and that was a good one, but it got me to thinking. I didn't answer the fact that when we're doing when I'm doing side dress of the nitrogen, quite often there's been some learning blocks put in there, to, to use a term. And, any, and we can see if we're hitting about the right amount of nitrogen based on yield response. And after doing that for four or five years, I'm pretty confident in, in the, the test numbers and, and the algorithms used, to for, used for the application level recommendation. So I, I think we're, you know, the, you know, the wild card on that one is how much is going to be metabolized during the year based on the weather. Uh, we, you know, how much comes out of that organic matter 
that is sitting there, how much, how much, how much microbial activity do you have during the summer and are the conditions good enough that you know, they, they crank out so much that you don't really didn't have to side dress at all or mm. are you gonna be, would you have been tight and you, you really lose yield? Yeah, that's where the uh, sap analysis of the plant at different growing stages can, can give you an indication of uh, plant utilization of the nitrogen there and then also doing deep soil probes uh, to see what is down there and available. Thank you. Yep. Question. Uh, thanks, Dale. I, I got a question on your uh, renewable energy and your sol solar panels. Mm -hmm. So, did uh, is it like uh, like other businesses or, or homes where you can get a maximum of 120 per 20 percent of your utility needs? Is that the limit of the solar panels that you can put in? And is your utility, uh, did they provide any uh, rebates or any uh, government uh, grants for your solar energy? Okay, so the state of Minnesota, um, you're limited to 40 kilowatt output on your panels. But you could, if I, I could put up something that um, had that ab ability for production on like a drainage well. So that would just, uh, you know, the drainage pump. So that might use up, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month when it's running, but it's not running for eight months out of the year. The whole time that, that the solar panels are generating, I'm getting paid for electricity. So that's, that's, that's state law in Minnesota that um, we're, we're not capped at, at 120 percent. You, you're, yep, 40 kW at a time. Um, my system is projected to generate pretty close to 100,000 kilowatt hours in a year's time. So, and, and, I, and I pay, I get paid the rate that I pay, that I said at the beginning of the year. So it, it works pretty well. And then the financial incentives for me is, now it's a 30% in, um, investment tax credit and then depreciate, depreciation interest. Uh, so, and part of my thought process was it's a way to expand the farm, add another enterprise. And I have to grease these things once a year. Oh yeah. <laughs> My knees don't get tired from pushing pigs around or anything like that. It's, you know, there's a lot less work involved. So. That's. These these are these are mounted. I'm going to repeat the question. Okay. The question is, do you, were you able to put them on your buildings, or do you uh, are they freestanding mounted? Yeah. Um, I was a little leery of putting them on the building because of the age of the buildings and the rafters, the truss is not necessarily being designed for it. Snow loads and other things like that that I get to think about. So I, they're freestanding, they're also dual axis. So at all time, at any time the sun is up, I've got solar noon going on. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll always face the sun. Pedro's got a question too, and then we'll move on. So I got a question. I mean, in, in report, there seems to be very several outcomes. And, and sometimes I think a little bit like pig cham or other records that we used to have at farms with sows per number of pigs per sow per year. And maybe some people define one way and another wo another way. And and uh, I wanted to ask, of all these ones, what do you think it would be a number that a metric that you, you think is important for you? Um, and, and, and what would you say we can do to improve that metric on, on the quality of, of information that we get uh, to, to build that metric or I, I guess which is the one that you would like to see and, and, and is it any th an improvement that you would like to see done to that metric? After this spring, especially after Memorial Day when we saw a tremendous dust cloud from, I, I'm sure it came from Nebraska, but not just Nebraska. I also saw it coming off neighboring fields. Soil erosion for me is the one that, that really makes a difference. Um, hmm. That this ground is valuable and what is getting eroded has the organic matter in there, has the high levels of NP and K. And, and keeping them on my ground means that I will get to produce soil. That's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Yeah, good, thank you again, Dale, for your time today and um, just your insight that you were willing to share. It's just. Uh, great to have that um, kind of application uh, brought to life. So thank you.